No problem. I mean, flood insurance is something that we all need to, you know, definitely have some um, information on and, and be knowledgeable about. Yeah, you know? exactly. I mean, it's not going anywhere at all. If, if anything, it's just going to continue to change and evolve. So anything we can do to help you guys stay up to date. Definitely. I, I, I yeah. lived in a flood area, in a flood zone before, and it's a nightmare. Oh, wow. Where were you? I was over there by um, Bow Creek, by the Bow Creek area, um, mm. in Virginia Beach. I'm not exactly sure where that is. Yeah, it's it floods all the time. What's but, it um, near? What's it near the neighborhood? Near Lynn Haven Mall. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, that entire neighborhood just flooded. But they did work on the, the um the sewage system. I guess the drain, the drains they did they have worked on that um recently. I think within the past year, or That's no, huge. About, about two years. Yeah, they worked on it, but. But it flooded right. really bad. It was so bad that um my house got was flooded. <laughs> Literally. Wow. I woke up oh my gosh, bedroom. Lily. Did you yeah. have flood insurance though? That I was renting and at a house and I had mm. rental insurance. And so Good. thank God for that, you know. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure the landlord had flood insurance on the property. Yeah. What was that? Yes, my landlords did. Landlord. They did. They did. Um, but you know, I had to file my own claim at the same time, which was, you know, thank God I yeah. had my own flood insurance. Uh, with, excuse me, not flood insurance, but I had rental in, um, right. insurance. And so they were covered, but I was also covered from my own personal items. Yeah. Because of course my landlord didn't cover the damage <clears throat> that happened so with what, my personal what, items. What was damaged of your personal items that they gave coverage for? Furniture. My furniture, I mean, literally the oh, water. Oh, so you had up. a renter's flood insurance policy. Right. I had a renter's okay, insurance. I was... Okay. And they did the renter's insurance. Their renter's insurance wouldn't cover that because it was a flood. Well, it did. It covered the damage that I have for my personal items. Oh, good. Well, that's good. Yeah, it good. did. Mm -hmm. Good to everyone signing on. Um, just wanted to share with you, if you want to get CE credit for this course, you have to turn on your camera. This is not um, a stipulation of mine. This is the Alpha College of Real Estate. Um, they say, since we've moved this to a virtual platform, just to ensure that everyone who is on is actually attending, you have to have your camera on. Um, if you, if you, if you're not super comfortable, you can turn it on and put like the clear tape over it. Just as long as I can see, you know, that you are there and attending the CE course. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to ask me. I see Christine and Esther just signed on. I love that picture. Was that taken at the Cavalier? Yes, it was actually. So pretty. Thank you. I know I need to change it. The holidays are over, mm -hmm. but I just love the picture. It's a great picture. I love it. I say thank you. It. I love it too. I'm gonna keep it there for a little long, a little longer. Good. Yes. I love going there on Thursdays, the ladies' night. Oh my gosh, with the champ, the like two or two dollar champagne or whatever. Yeah, that's right, two dollars. The best <laughs> night. Or you can get a glass of the Vove for like ten dollars, which seems a little steep, but not for not for that champagne. And it's so good. It's so good. It is worth it. Yeah. Or you can get the cheap bottle for ten dollars. Exactly. Bottle. And yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, you're still sipping. <laughs> exactly. Good morning to everyone signing on. Good morning. Hi. Um, and as people start begin to sign on, I just want to let you know that um, Alpha College requires you to have your camera on if you want to receive the flood insurance CE credit for this course. Since I can't, since we can't like be in person, and I know that you're like actually there attending, you have to turn on your camera. 
So if, if you want to, you can always put that little bit of masking tape over the camera. Um, but yeah, so I appreciate you, saw, you guys um, doing that if you want to get credit for it. Uh oh, you're you're um, muted, Regina. I said I'm going to turn you upside down at one point because I actually have to get changed. So. That's fine. No worries. <laughs> no worries. I don't think you want the camera on, but I'll be listening. Great. Hi, Esther. Hi, Christine. Hi, Jordan. Oh, hello, little puppy. I don't know how many people we have slated to attend this morning, so I'm going to give it a couple more minutes, but um, yeah, just a uh, hi, Jordan. She's muted. And then, like I said, I'll give it a couple more minutes and then I will get started. Before you get started, can I ask you, do you sell flood insurance or are you just, are you an agent or? So I work for, yep, I'm going to go over that. I work for Prosper Insurance and we do do flood insurance. I do have my insurance license, but I'm not the actual agent that writes the policies. Prosper has agents in the office that can do that for you. Okay, great. I have something you, I might want you to participate in, so I'll send you a message oh, on this. I, I would love that. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. I just didn't want to interrupt you later on a bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, and this is going to be like super informal. If you guys have questions, feel free to interrupt. <laughs> okay, great. I'm going to, I'm going to put in the contact my information so that we can text and I'll send you information for like a mini bridal expo and planning for February. Okay, great. We're going to do you. like a first time buyers thing. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh -huh, thank you. I'm going to text Thomasina really quickly, y'all. All right, good morning to um, those of you that just signed on, uh, Christopher Rivers and Celinda Gobelow. I hope I got that right. Um, just wanted to let you guys know, if you want to receive CE credit for this, Alpha College requires that you have your camera on so I can see that you actually attended this course. Um, and then, I will need all of you guys to put in the chat box at some point your email address so I can email you the CE enrollment form that um, you can fill out via DocuSign. That way I can submit it to the Alpha College of Real Estate so you get the CE credit for today. So just a couple of things I need from you guys is your email address and turn on your camera if you want CE credit. I'm on. How's it going, Thank everybody? you. Hi. Appreciate it. Let's see. Oh, I see some chats coming in with the emails. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And Christine, I know you signed on earlier. I don't know if you can hear me, but I will need you to put your um, camera on. And Celinda, same for you. And, and if, if you're not planning on getting CE credit for this, just shoot me a message in the chat box and I'll stop bugging you about the camera. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, Regina, where do you own a dance studio? That's fun. It's on Rosemont Road, right off of 264, across from the Fuller Massage School. So you could go get a massage and then learn how to dance with me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> We're not just a dance studio, but we hold events. So before COVID, we would book every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for baby showers, weddings, um, uh, birthday parties, retirement parties, you name it. Like we were fully booked when we got shut down. What kind of dance courses do you offer? Is it like ballet or? No. So it's a very diverse studio. Um, it's for independent uh, contractors and so we have everything from hip-hop and we primarily work with adults um, but I do do some day classes sometimes for homeschoolers but I teach ballroom swing and salsa we have everything swing swing Virginia he teaches everything um, we have desired dance which is a very sexy heels class for ladies it's very popular there's jazzercise it's we keep pretty busy cool. <clears throat> I had two studios and I lost one. I just opened a brand new oh, one sorry. right before COVID hit. I lost so much of my money, retirement and everything. And so that's why I got into real estate to try to have some other source of income that's not touching people in groups of 50 or more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> awesome. All right, it is, we are hitting the seven minute mark. So I will go ahead and get us started. So one more time, I'm gonna repeat this and then I will stop. If you're on here and you want to receive CE credit, uh, you will need to turn on your camera just so I can see that you attended. And this is required by the Alpha College of Real Estate, not me. Um, if you do not want to receive CE credit for this, just shoot me a message in chat and I'll um, stop bugging you to turn on your camera. And then also I will need you to message me your email address so that I can provide you with the course enrollment form after this class. I'll send them via DocuSign. You just got to um, do it virtually. Uh, or digitally rather. Um, you don't need to worry about payment. Prosper Insurance is going to take care of the $10 fee for you guys to get your credit. So the sooner I can get those forms to you guys and filled out and sent over to Alpha College, the sooner they will um, post on your um, transcript. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Multiple. Oh. There we go, screen two. All right, and Regina, can you give me a thumbs up that you can see my screen? Can you see the slideshow? Chris, did you give me a thumbs up, somebody? I okay. can see it. Sorry, I was trying to put my email in. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started, I think, Everyone on here, Sheila, I do need you to turn on your camera if you want to get um, credit for this. And great. All right, so I'm just going to get started here. Uh, my name is Sarah Dotson, and I am the business development executive at Prosper Insurance. I was on your team meeting last Tuesday where I introduced myself and um, we're going to be one of the insurance partners of the your Keller Williams office uh, this year, 2021. And I'm really looking forward to working with you guys and, and getting to know each of you a little bit better. Um, who in here besides Tuesday and today have, has heard of Prosper Insurance? Yes. Okay, great. Um, any, any of you guys ever used, used us? No, no, okay. Well, I'll just do a, a brief little background. Uh, Prosper Insurance is an in, a local independent insurance agency. We've been around since about 2008. And our two owners, Drew Monroe and Rohan Shetty, like went to high school together. Um, they both went to college and then got back together afterwards and decided they, they both got into the insurance business and then decided they wanted to open their own local agency. So here we are. We have um, a team of sales agents and we're able to write with over 30 different insurance carriers, which means that we can, you know, shop 
different companies in order to find the best policy for your clients. Um, and then if you guys have any other questions about, you know, what we can do and how we can help you, uh, feel free to message me afterwards and we can set something up and I can chat with you guys about it. But I want to get into the CE course. So I know you guys probably have busy days and I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, so today we're going to be talking about understanding flood insurance and really give you some tips and tricks to avoid closing delays. You used to not be required to get a CE of flood insurance as a realtor, but that changed a few years ago and there's a reason for that. In 2012, Congress passed the Bigger Waters Insurance Reform Act and it had a really big impact on the industry and on real estate values. Um, there may be, there may have been something that happened that tripped up one of your transactions or made a buyer not qualify for a loan due to, you know, a flood zone or a high premium. Have, have, have any of you guys ever experienced that before? Where flood insurance has caused a delay in a transaction or caused a client to not qualify? It can be the biggest pain in the tail. And it's one of the reasons I think it should be disclosed on like one of the mandatory fields in the MLS. Right, exactly. Yeah, it can. It, it totally can, um, can cause like a big delay, especially if you don't know up front, you know, and we're going to get into that uh, in, in a little bit. So um, yeah, my goal here today is to not really bore you with a bunch of forms and coverages. Instead, I want to talk about ways or things that you guys can do to be aware of and possibly prevent stumbling blocks as an agent. If you get into a transaction, whether on the buying side or a listing side, you know, if the home's in a high risk flood zone, if there's an expensive flood rate, you know, what are your options? Um, a little bit of background, uh, historically, private insurance companies did not cover flood insurance due to the fact that flood damage is uh, generally catastrophic and hard to predict and set rates for. So in 1968, the National Flood Insurance Program was created in order to provide flood coverage to people living within those floodplains at a reasonable rate for, for them. Uh, they had risk-based premiums to help make people aware of and bear the cost of flood coverage. And just keep that in your mind. We're going to go back to that in a little bit with um, reasonable rates and, um, you know, making it afford affordable for everybody. Uh, they came up with the definition of a flood, which is any sort of rising water. Um, it needs to hit two or more properties and two acres of land in order for FEMA to deem that a flood. So two properties impacted and more than two acres of land. That's what FEMA, uh, FEMA would deem a flood. So this next um, slide we're gonna talk about are the flood zones, which I'm sure all of you guys are super familiar with. This is what how it would be listed on the MLS if a home is in a high risk or a low risk zone. Um, we have the preferred zones, which are X, B, and C, which means that a, um, you know, a mortgage company is not gonna require flood insurance. Um, one thing you never want to say as a realtor though is, Great news, you're not in a flood zone and you don't need flood insurance. Um, actually, a third of all flood claims happen in low risk zones. Uh, take it, like, remember back when I think it was Hurricane Matthew hit a few Octobers ago, like a few years ago, and it, I think it was like the Windsor Woods area flooded really badly. And a, a lot of that area was considered a low risk flood zone. So a lot of folks there did not have flood insurance. So much better language to use is great news. You're in a low risk flood zone. You can get flood insurance if you want to. It's not gonna impact your loan or it's not gonna be a part of your loan or impact your monthly payments. So as far as um, being in a preferred zone, the X, B, and C, you are eligible for what is 
called a preferred risk policy that offers low cost coverage to owners and tenants. You can get like a renters or a tenants flood insurance policy. Um, and it, like I said, it's not going to impact the transaction because the lender won't need it to go to closing and the buyer or the renter or the homeowner will pay for it out of their own pocket. And right now, I think the, the going rate for the highest amount of coverage is like five or $500 a year. So not that much for peace of mind to have it. And then your next zones, those are the high risk zones, also considered a special, a special flood hazard area. That's where you're going to see the A, AE, V, and VE. And coverage will be required by a lender and it will have an impact on their debt to income ratio um, if they're having the home finance. Now, I always put in a special little caveat here. If if a buyer is purchasing, you know, using cash, obviously they don't have anyone telling them they need to get a flood insurance policy. So, you know, they don't have to get have to get a flood insurance policy. Um, a lot of times when they're buying cash, it, it's like an investor situation and they're coming in, they plan to flip the home and put it back on the market and sell it. One thing I like to talk to you guys about so you can educate your investor buyers if you work with them is it's really important for them to understand that the person that they're selling it to on the back end most likely will have a mortgage. So what does that mean? That means that their lender is going to require them to have flood insurance in order to close. So let's say the investor, you know, purchases this, this home cash, their realtor didn't, you know, think to look and see if it's in a high risk or low risk flood zone. It wasn't listed on the MLS like we feel like it really should be. So they buy this home, they put some money into it, they put it on the market. Well, guess what? They find out it's in a high risk flood zone. The flood rate is expensive. It's going to take them a really long time, you know, potentially to sell this home. So I just like to let you guys know to be aware of that. Always check if it's in a high risk or low risk flood zone, whether the they're buying in cash or not, just to kind of cover themselves. If they do find out it's in a high risk flood zone, maybe there's some things they can do when they're flipping the property that can, you know, help mitigate any, um, you know, the, the premiums. And we'll, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But just because there's not a lender involved and they're buying cash doesn't mean that you don't need to worry about um, flood zones and flood insurance. Um, any questions on that? Okay, sorry, I, I kind of went off the rails there. Um, so, um, like I said, just something to keep in mind. So back to the zones, A stands for accumulation and V stands for velocity. So think like a couple of blocks from the beach. You're gonna see that like in Sandbridge, uh, down in the Outer Banks. Um, homes that are in A or AE zones need to be on a crawl space. If it's on a slab, it's going to be an expensive policy, and um, we'll get into examples of that in just a couple of minutes. And then homes that are in the VE zones need to be on pilings or stilts. I like to joke that VE stands for very expensive because it is going to be, you know, a pretty expensive flood policy just due to the fact of where it is. Like the, it's in such a big potential to flood, the houses are raised. So, just a little. A little joke we like to make. Um, and then as far as like, um, I get this question all the time um, regarding like the A and VE flood zones and it being in a 100 year flood plain. What that means is if it's in a 100 year flood plain is that there's a 1% chance of experiencing a flood in any given year over the course of a 30 year mortgage. So that equals 26% chance of that homeowner experiencing um, a flood. And one thing to keep in mind is the closer a structure is to a flooding source, so a river, a stream, the bay, the ocean, et cetera, the higher the risk. So then the risk would increase from like 26% 
to 45% over the course of a 30-year mortgage. And then you'll see the 500-year floodplain. So that's considered like a low-risk flood zone, that X, B, or C. So that just means there's a 0.2% chance of flood in any given year and 6% over the course of a 30-year mortgage. But remember, what did I just say? That a third of all floodplains happen in those low-risk areas. So highly recommend your buyers looking into obtaining flood insurance at a low cost just to you know, provide them with some peace of mind. Um, so some flood definitions. Um, I just said this, if you're in a high risk zone, um, FEMA thinks that you have more than 1% chance on an annual basis for the water to come up to the footing of your house. So if the home is sitting on a crawl space, that means they think that there's a 1% chance that water is going to touch your house during that time period. Every home in a high risk zone has what is called a base flood elevation, which is how high above sea level they think water will rise during a storm. So the base flood elevation on its own, on its own is not what defines how expensive a flood policy is going to be. And this is always fun for me to do on camera. It's so much easier in person. Imagine the base flood elevation is right here where my hand is. And um, most of Hampton Roads is between eight and 10 feet. So for good math, we're just gonna call this eight feet right here. And so base flood elevation, eight feet. Let's say your yard is sitting at seven and a half feet. So it's a half a foot below the base flood elevation. What that means is your home is in a um, high risk um, flood zone because your home is sitting lower than they think the water is going to rise during a storm. So now let's take this same home and put it on a crawl space. So if it were sitting on a slab right here, it's gonna be an expensive flood policy because the water is just gonna run right through it. But let's say you take this same home and raise it three feet. So now it's sitting above the base flood elevation. So it's still obviously considered in a high risk flood zone. However, the flood insurance premium is gonna be lower because the home is sitting up above on a crawl space and the water has somewhere to like flow through that's not gonna cause damage to the home. So all of FEMA's rates go to how high above or below the base flood elevation to the living floor is. So the higher above the base flood elevation, the lower the premium and vice versa. So that's why if your home is sitting on a slab, it's gonna be expensive because the water is just gonna you know, run through the house. And then the adjacent grade, that's just you know, the natural elevation of the ground um, basically the dirt outside of your home. Um, any questions so far? No? Okay. Great. All right. So subsidize versus full risk, full risk rates. Let's uh, say that five times fast. When the National Flood Insurance Program was created in 1968, um, I said this earlier, its goal was to provide affordable insurance to help communities rebuild after flooding. Um, in the years since, the program's finances have basically gone from bad to worse, and uh, the program loses about $1.4 billion each year, and their debt exceeds $20 billion. This is due to those um, catastrophic storms we've experienced over the past, you know, like 10 to 15 years. So think Hurricane Katrina, Sandy, Matthew, Harvey, et cetera. Um, so roughly all of um, what's 20%, roughly 20% of all of the national flood insurance policies are calculated using these subsidized rates. Um, and most of the policies that were written are pre-FIRM. So what does FIRM stand for? for F-I-R-M. It stands for Flood Insurance Rate Map. And pre-FIRM means that the home was constructed before their community adopted its first flood insurance rate map in these high-risk areas, 
zones A and B. Um, before the Bigger Waters um, Act was put into policy, uh, into um, was signed and put in put in force, these policies could be rated without an elevation certificate. Um, unfortunately, that is no longer the case with FEMA. So whenever you have a home that's in a high risk flood zone and it has you're you're working on getting a FEMA flood policy, in order to get a rate, the flood insurance company is going to require an elevation certificate. And I don't know if you guys have ever had to chase down um, an elevation certificate, but it can it can actually, it can cause some delays and, and take up some time. Um, maybe the home was recently remapped into a high risk flood zone and there isn't an elevation certificate. You've got to, you know, go out and get it. Um, have some or go out and have like a um, surveyor uh, make one and it can cost money and take time and um, there's some ways to get around that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, the goal moving forward is to um, move from these subsidized rates because FEMA needs um, money since they're in so much debt and the goal is to you know move more towards these full risk rates, which is sufficient to fund the reserves for any anticipated losses. Um, they're going to have to have an elevation certificate in order to get a quote. Um, they're going to raise rates on even preferred risk policies, which they've already done. Um, when I first got into insurance, you could get a preferred risk policy for about $400 and now it's five to $550. So it's already gone up, you know, quite a bit in the last few years. And the they're looking at about a 25% increase a year until um, they hit what they consider a full risk rate. And on this next slide, I just like to show this. This is the dates that the cities here in Hampton Roads joined the National Flood Insurance Program and adopted their first flood insurance um, rate map. I find it very interesting. So a little bit of context, the program was created in 1968. So you see like um, Portsmouth here joined pretty quickly, just a, about four years or three years later, um, 1971, Hampton 1971, um, and Virginia Beach. I mean, those make sense. They're pretty, they're near bodies of water. What does surprise me is Norfolk was like 11 years later and Norfolk, I feel like floods when you spill a cup of water, but maybe it wasn't so bad back then. Um, and then the other areas like Suffolk and Yorktown were much later, but they're, they're further inland. But that's just good information for you guys to know as far as like when homes homes were built and now that we're getting you know further and further and further away from that 1968 we're seeing a lot of homes you know especially in like Chesapeake and Suffolk and Virginia Beach that are newer construction or built you know within the last like 15 to 20 years ago so getting further away from having to worry about a home being constructed prior to joining the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, this next slide is just for cities out in Southwest Virginia because I do this course uh, for some real estate offices out there as well. Um, and, you know, they were all much later to join because they are further inland, except for Waynesboro. They got on the train pretty quickly. Um, any questions before I go over this next slide? Okay. So in 2014, Oh, do I have a question? Did I have someone put something in the chat? I kind of can't. I've got because I've got my screen shared. I can't really see the chat. Can can they just they just said no, no questions. Okay, no questions. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so in 2014, um, Congress passed the Flood Insurance Reform Act, um, the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act. Um, the basically the goal of or the purpose of this is to continue to make the National Flood Insurance Program more financially stable by raising rates on certain classes of property to reflect that true, you know, flood risk rate that I talked about a couple of minutes ago. 
it can trigger rate changes for properties within these revised or updated um, map areas to accurately reflect the flood risk. So, you know, changing um, like Windsor Woods, for example, I'm sure that was remapped after Hurricane Matthew and those homes went from being in low risk flood zone to a high risk flood zone and the folks living in that area that had a mortgage had to get a flood insurance policy. And then the rates definitely um, would be more expensive than that of a preferred risk policy. Um, it means increased rates for policyholders at renewal and buying or selling a property and allowing a policy to lapse will trigger a rate change. Um, one thing we do do a lot of um, in the insurance world and at Prosper, um, if a buyer is purchasing a home that is in a high risk flood zone, the seller already has a flood insurance policy in place. Um, they, we can transfer that policy over to the new buyer. Um, that is something that happens often because let's say the seller's flood insurance policy, let's say it's like $700 and the buyer, the new policy for the buyer is like $1,000. Um, that they can totally do that to get to closing. That way they qualify for their loan. It happens all the time. However, we always educate our clients on this and hope that you will as well, that first of all, that flood insurance policy that they're assuming from the seller is only good and in place for the term left on that policy. So they're going to want to look at the expiration date. It could be a month. It could be six months. It could be four months. You know, um, it doesn't start over at the time of closing and go for a year. So only what's remaining is how long it will be in effect until the policy will renew. And one thing they need to keep in mind is that renewal, that premium likely will increase. Now, it probably won't increase to the, you know, like 1,000 or whatever they had been quoted before, but it is going to increase um, more than likely. And so they will need to remember to, you know, account for that at renewal going forward because that means that they're going to need to have a little bit more money in their escrow to cover the um the gap in between and um it will have an effect on home values in the real estate industry and i think that's already happened um, for these homes that are in the high risk flood zones um, a lot of people don't want to deal with the flood insurance um, it makes them harder to come by and to buy kind of a headache so it's just been, you know, kind of a headache, but we have some ways to get around this. Um, the impact, all policies will have increased rates. And I said up to 25% increase per year until they get that full risk rate. Um, the properties affected could drop in value. They've also added a $25 primary residence fee to every single flood insurance policy, and they need to have proof that it's your primary residence. So if they're purchasing the home, closing documents will suffice. If they're getting flood insurance, um, not for a real estate transaction, they will just have to show some other sort of proof like mail, ID, et cetera. And the reason they're requiring proof that it's your primary residence is because if it's a non-primary residence, so a secondary home, a rental, et cetera, that $25 surcharge goes up to $250 um, that they'll have to pay each year. And then, so we're gonna get into some, some mitigation, some things that um, can, that you can do or that buyers can do or um, you can communicate to folks to do that can help save them money on their flood insurance premiums. Um, one pretty easy and not super expensive way is adding the correct square inches. So I'm going to say that again, square inches of flood fence to a home on a crawl space could dramatically lower the premium. I myself have had experience with this. Um, back when I did write insurance uh, for a different company, it was for a, a real estate company's insurance um, agency. There, there was a, um, a buyer, he bought a home that was in a high risk flood zone. I ran the flood insurance quote, had the elevation certificate and the premium was $1,200, which really doesn't sound like a whole lot 
But for them, it was a lot because it kept them from qualifying for their loan. So after some back and forth with the underwriters at the insurance company, they were like, look, they don't have the you know, correct number of square inches of flood vents to be compliant to you know, receive an even like bigger discount. So I communicated that to the realtor and the seller and the buyer struck up a deal. I don't know who paid for what, but they added additional um, crawl space vents so then they were compliant with having the correct square inches uh, flood vents to the square footage of the crawl space. So if the crawl space is like 2,000 square feet. I think they need like 2,000 square inches uh, of flood vents. And the policy literally dropped by 50% and went from $1,200 to $600. And then they were able to qualify for their loan and move into the home. Um, and then, you know, whenever they were ready to sell it, it would make it easier for them to sell as well. So adding um, the correct square inches of flood vents and you can, you know, have one of those like an engineer go out and, and do that. Um, a LOMA. So a LOMA stands for a letter of map amendment. And that is typically issued because a property has been inadvertently mapped as being in a floodplain or a high risk flood zone, but is actually like on natural high ground above the base flood elevation. So if, if that has happened, what a homeowner can do, if you know, if they've been mapped into a high risk zone and they're like, hold on, you know, my home sits up pretty high. There's no water that ever comes up around here. All they have to do is submit this letter of map amendment to FEMA. FEMA will send someone out to survey. And if they do, you know, decide that it was wrongly remapped into that high risk flood zone, they can just, you know, put it back into the lower risk flood zone. But again, um, just being a dead horse over here doesn't mean that it's never going to flood. So maybe that would be a really good opportunity for them to get a preferred risk policy just to cover themselves. Um, the the built to code grandfathering. So the grandfathering rule is that um, a flood insurance policy was in effect when a new flood map became effective and the homeowner maintained continuous coverage. Um, or the home was built in compliance with the flood insurance rate map effective at the time of construction. So what exactly does that mean? So the results of grandfathering can provide like cost savings to a property owner or purchaser when a new flood map or a new map takes effect. Um, however, um, there will be cases when using the elevation rating like the the you know, information that's on the elevation certificate with the new flood map that's just came out could result in lower premiums than, um, than the grandfathering rule than you know, the, using the previous um, map. So both options should always be evaluated. Um, and it's important to remember that if a building has been substantially um, improved or damaged, it is not eligible to be grandfathered to the flood map that was in effect at the original construction date. So let's say the home was built in 1977, but then you know 20 years later it was substantially damaged um, or substantially improved. Um, the map that was in effect at the time of the improvement or the damage is the one that must be used. Um, raising the home, I mean, I know that is definitely an initial expense up front. However, it could save the homeowner money in the long run as flood rates continue to increase. Um, as I said, I live in Norfolk and I see this happening often, especially in like the Lock Haven, Larchmont areas. There's that body of water back there. And I've seen several homes like under construction being raised up, but because the flood insurance is just so expensive out there that it's just easier for the, it's just cheaper for the homeowner to go ahead and bite the bullet and, you know, raise the home, pay that expense, but then over time they'll, you know, get that money back that they're not spending on flood insurance. Um, and then get your clients to work with an insurance agency that understands flood insurance. And like I said, 
you know, our agents stay up to date on all of the changes that's happening within FEMA and the National Flood Insurance Program. We, you know, write with several different carriers, so we have different options, and they're just, you know, constantly dealing with it on a daily basis. Um, so at the beginning of this, I mentioned that private insurance companies you know, didn't offer flood insurance when the, and that's why the National Flood Insurance Program was created. However, in the last several years, they have begun to dip their toes in the market, into the flood insurance market. And now private market flood is a viable alternative to purchasing a FEMA flood policy. Um, if a buyer is purchasing or lives in a high risk area, they can get a policy through a private insurance company to satisfy their mortgage requirements. There's only one mortgage product that will not accept a private flood policy and that's FHA. They are a government backed loan. Right now they want a government backed policy. VA used to be the same, but now VA will accept the private insurance, like private flood policy. So hopefully FHA will move in that direction as well. So uh, the private markets, uh, like I said, most homes qualify. They very often have a lower rate, but our agents will always you know, run a quote through the private and through FEMA just, just to make sure it, you know, whatever the, is best for the buyer. They have better and higher coverages available, which I'll get into in a moment. An elevation certificate is not required. So you do not have to have one. If there is not one available and time is of the essence or your buyer doesn't want to spend, you know, the five to seven hundred dollars to send someone out there, you know, to create an elevation certificate, they don't need it in order to get a policy. So you can just take that off. Uh, there's a better claims process because you're dealing with an insurance company and you're not dealing with um, the government. And then more options and competitions will create benefits, i.e., you know, better coverages and uh, lower premiums for these homeowners. So here's a little like infograph thing that shows you the differences between like the private market flood and the standard FEMA policy. Um, well, we have an in-office certified FEMA flood expert. Um, Prosper does have that, but um, as far as coverages go for the private market flood, they offer separate other structures coverage. So when a FEMA policy, they're only going to cover the, the dwelling that, that they're living in. So if there is a detached garage or a detached shed or a pool house, whatever detaches on the property, if you wanted flood insurance coverage through FEMA on that, you would have to purchase a separate policy because that one would only go towards the dwelling and your contents inside. It would not extend to any other um, building on your property. But with the private market flood, they offer it and it kind of mirrors your um, homeowner's insurance where it's like 10 or 20% of the dwelling coverage is applied to coverage of that building. So that's huge, especially if you have like a really nice garage or, or shed and you have some like nice lawn tools in there that it has coverage. Um, replacement costs, contents coverage. So FEMA does offer coverage for your belongings in your home in the event of a flood, but it's on an actual cash value um, basis. It's not replacement costs. So if you have you know, a, a $1,500 couch that gets ruined in a flood, they're not going to replace it for a $1,500 couch. They're going to replace it at the depreciated value. So maybe you're only getting like, you know, $800 out of it, but the private market will replace your couch with another $1,500 couch. Um, they also offer limits over 250,000. Right now with FEMA, the highest level of coverage you can get on your home is 250,000. That is it. Um, and for, I would say for the most part, that's pretty much, you know, it, appropriate and adequate. But for these homes, let's say down at the oceanfront or in Sam or in Sandbridge that are valued at, you know, $750,000 and higher, 
and you know really custom build $250,000 is not a lot to put towards, you know, flood damage. So they can raise those rates so that they feel like they are more adequately covered with the um, private market flood. And then coverage is immediate. Um, right now through FEMA, unless the, um, there is like a real estate trans, it's like tied to a real estate transaction. So it's going to closing or it's a refinance. There is a 30 day waiting period before FEMA coverage will go into place. But the private market flood, if you called them today and paid for it today, it would go into effect immediately. And then the um, last one is they do not have that $250 secondary um, surcharge. If it's a rental or vacation home uh, flood policy, you're not gonna have to pay an additional $250 surcharge on top of the premium. And then I have just a couple of examples um, that I got from our agents in the office where private market flood was a much better option for their buyers. Um, one of our agents was quoting a home that had a finished mother-in-law suite on the property. And the mortgage company was actually requiring that they have flood insurance on the mother-in-law suite as well as the home. So um, remember FEMA it would have had to have been two separate policies. So one for the home, one for the mother-in-law suite. And the combined total of both policies was $7,500, um, which obviously they did not want to pay. So um, they quoted it through the private market flood and they were able to get one policy with coverage for both buildings for $3,500. So they saved them $4,000, which is huge. Um, obviously they went with that when and closed and everything was totally fine. And then another one of our agents uh, sold this policy to his brother-in-law. Um, the property had a swimming pool and um, obviously FEMA wouldn't cover, uh, provide coverage for the swimming pool. And um, it was like a $3,500 policy, but then through the private market, it was only $1,800 and it provided coverage for the pool. So that's just a couple of, couple of examples of the private market. Um, we work with, I think, three different private market flood insurance companies um, that we quote for our customers. And again, um, you know, it always goes back to your buyer and their needs. And you know, we understand that buying insurance, especially flood insurance, can be complicated. So you know, we like to guide and educate our customers so they can feel good about the insurance that they are purchasing. You know, maybe they're, they don't really care about wanting all the bells and whistles. And if the FEMA policy is less expensive, they'll wanna go with that one. But then there are other customers that, you know, what if the private market flood is a little bit more expensive than FEMA, they're okay paying that additional because they know they're getting, you know, higher and better coverage. Um, but in most cases, private, proves to be a little bit, um, you know, a lot less expensive than FEMA. Um, and that that is basically it. Um, you can check to see, here's some resources. You can check to see if a home is in a flood zone um, by going to this website, you know, right here. If you're like me, you think the, those maps can kind of be a headache. And um, so if you really are wanting to know if a home is in a high risk flood zone, you can reach out to me and I can have an agent look at it for you. It literally takes like 60 seconds and lets you know, you know, if it's in a high or low risk zone. And here's my contact information. You guys wanna take that down and reach out to me if you have any questions. And that is it. Any, any ah. questions? Any um, before you guys start with questions, can you all put your, and I know she said at the beginning, but um, can y'all put your email address in the chat session? Just make sure it's in there so that she can copy and paste to make sure that you get credit. You need to fill out the form that she's going to send you through DocuSign. So just put your email address um, in there and she'll send that to you. And now you guys can ask as many questions as you want. Yes, thank you. Yeah, any questions? I'm I just now looking to see the chat. Some Someone put something in here about when a storm comes in. I don't know if that was a question or just stating something. Esther, thank you. Thanks for being on here. 
Did everybody put their email in here? I think they did. I just want to make sure I copy all of this and get it. And I have it recorded, so I will repost it on our Facebook too, everyone, so that you can watch it over and over. Um, but uh, make sure your email's in there to get credit, but you can watch it over and over just to kind of like refresh it. And I think Celinda was getting ready to ask a question. Yeah. Hi, Celinda. Hi. Um, do you have like a flyer that you can email to me so that if I do have something, I can send it to a client? Yeah, we do um, have a little brochure, a PDF brochure I can okay. um, send to you. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, Sarah, if you want to upload that PDF brochure onto our Facebook page too. Oh yeah, I can do that. Um, if you want to put it on there and say, here is the PDF brochure that was asked about today in the class, please feel free to download, you know, that way you have it there too, as well as, well as sending it to them when you send them the thing. But at least it'll be on the Facebook because a lot of people will watch this and they'll probably want it too. Okay, great. Yep, I can definitely do that. Well, I really appreciate you guys. Uh, coming today and um, our next one will be in February and I believe we're going to be going over um, homeowners insurance. So y'all awesome. have a wonderful day and I'll see y'all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.